this fifth piece is on contextualism and theological application. So what is going, and then I'm gonna do a review of the five around what we're to do, and then we'll have a discussion on contextualism and theological application. But going over the syllabus that you should have, if you pull that up with Dr. Morton sent you, you'll see the same formatting. Everything is the same from the previous. But um, you will notice that the required textbook for this class is a piece by Nancy T. Ammerman, uh, uh, Carol Daxon, and Carl Dudley, along with William McKinney, in terms of studying congregations. And so um, that is a piece that you should have. Now, I don't know uh, whether you all can see this or not. I don't know how to do this on the screen. Uh, I just don't, I don't know how to do this. But you can see a flicker of a book. You should, let's, let's see. I really don't know how to do that. But the book, I'm holding it up. I don't see it. That means you can't see it. You can see a little flicker of it. It's entitled Studying Congregations. And this is a must read. So to Gamillion, Richie, to Q, to Cherry, to Roberts, one, two, three, four, five. This is a must read. And it's entitled Studying Congregations. And you will notice when you get this book, all the information is on your syllabus. This is also one of the required readings for the whole DMAN program. You must get this one. And it will begin in this table of contents with an introduction around congregational study. And the same principles for congregational study relate to contextual study because the congregation becomes the context. So how do I study Zitzenleben or setting, place? You know, what's, what's going on there? Which is what this book is all about. How to study a context, in this instance, congregation. And it talks about that in the introduction. And then the first chapter is theology in the congregation, discovering what that theology is in the congregation and the doing of that. And um, one of the interesting things about all of that is it, it opens up with Johnny Ray Youngblood. Some of you know him. I've had the privilege of being on panels with Johnny Ray Youngblood in, the, in um, with Reverend Sharpton. And also uh, Johnny Ray Youngblood served on Dr. Dixon's doctoral committee as one of his adjunct professors. And so, uh, Johnny Ray Youngblood is such a, a special voice, retired now, but his work there at the St. Paul's Church there in um, in New York is, is very, very worthy of your attention. But this author, the authors here, use a story out of Johnny Ray Youngblood. Um, and uh, they talk about a story that he suggests and uh, it is suggested in that chapter, at least, about someone who was doing some cooking and uh, they didn't know exactly what to do. So they thought about what they had experienced in the past when they saw um, their um, mother and grandmother do this with a turkey, I believe it is. And the, the mother had a turkey that was, you know, this size. And that's what she had seen her mother grandmother prepared the turkey in a, 
So when it came down to her doing the cooking for this, she went and got a, a pan or a pot this size, bought it, and wanted to use it for the turkey that she was going to prepare. The problem is that the size of the pot fit the size of the type of turkey size that her grandmother and mother would prepare. But the turkey that she had was actually much larger than that. So the pot she had was too small. And the way that was found out as to why she had this small pot was because she said, well, that's the size that my grandmother and my mother used. So it's just a little simple story to help you to appreciate that in your context, people are doing what they're doing, right or wrong, sensical or nonsensical, based on what they've observed in the past. And unless you become the resident theologian to guide them to understand how that pans out with what the condition is now, people typically do what they have known. Socrates says it this way, knowledge and virtue are the same. In essence, moral excellence is only done as moral excellence is seen. So I do what I've seen, or I do what I know. When I know better, I will do better. But my actions will be reflective of previous observances and understandings. Your theology in your context is not necessarily the theology you have. A part of being successful in any context, large or small, whether it be the church, the mission field, the city itself, the state, the region of the country, a different country, is getting to study and understand how people think theologically and how they act on that praxis, action and reflection. Um, I will also say this about Johnny Run, Ray Youngblood, great book, uh, Upon This Rock. How many of you read that? Yes. Open your mic and tell me if you've read uh, Johnny Ray Youngblood's Upon This Rock. Marissa, I some of you all might be doing other things and that's fine, I understand. But Marissa James, and none of you read the, uh, uh, Bishop Gamillion. You, uh, have you read uh, uh, Johnny Ray Youngblood's Upon This Rock? All right. Well, you probably could tell me some books I haven't read. So it works both ways, right? So, but I'm, I'm encouraging you to maybe go do, first of all, do you all even know who Johnny Ray Youngblood is? Has anybody ever heard of that name before? All right, Gamillion has. Anybody else? All right, these are names, once again, I want you to become familiar with, okay? But uh, real quickly, uh, con uh, contextualization and theological application, staying on Johnny Young, Ray Youngblood for just a moment. And let me tell you how this really tells you what this class is about by this example. Johnny Ray Youngblood has an appreciation for the Urban Dictionary. And the, the Urban Dictionary is excellent, etymologically speaking, around the whole understanding of Ebonics. So it is the indigenous cultural speaking language, getting back to what Jerome Ross in my lecture said is one of the seven uh, areas that we need to work on for survival, and that is to get a common language because you can't do much unless you all understand the language you're using, right? Because there'll be miscommunication and gaps and and um, and so many things that will go awry because the language isn't common and well known. Well, um, getting back to Johnny Ray Youngblood, he understood the language of the people that he was serving there um, in New York. And he realized that they liked to cuss. The people he had, they liked to cuss. They, they understood that language very well. 
<laughs> now, he had to make a decision as to whether or not he would lower himself, if that is lowering, and speak the language that they understood so that he could elevate them, transform them beyond expertise to empowerment language necessary for trafficking in the academy and in the boardrooms and real places where huge decisions are made in this country and world. So the first thing I want to ask you all, are y'all able to go there? Now the judge, I was listening, uh, James Richard, the judge said today that I'll cuss you out. Did she say that? Or did I make did I hear that correctly? Somebody open your mic and talk to me. I feel like I'm talking to, to a screen. Yeah, somebody no, talk right. to me. That, that, that's, what, that's what I heard as well. So. All right. Ch Ch uh, Cherry Q or Marissa, did y'all hear that? I will make sure my ears were hearing right. Uh, she's, a, she's a judge and she said, I, I, I cuss you out. I'm a Christian and I'll cuss you out. <laughs> I hear you, Dr. Cole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, so listen, I'm again, all I'm trying to do is to tell you when you start dealing with contextualization, you got to decide whether or not you're going to do Jesus. Can I tell you that Jesus came down through 40 and two generations, left that lofty place there, came down and dwelt amongst us, was hanging out in graveyards, going places where they said you shouldn't be. And eating with folks he shouldn't eat with. With people folks he shouldn't eat with. Mm -hmm. This is our Lord. Mm -hmm. It's that spiritual formation, Christ likeness, spiritual maturity. So anyway, I'm not advocating cussing. I'm just saying that John, that John and Ray Youngblood understood that if he was going to do any ministry in the context that he was called. I, I have heard him preach. Yeah, and he doesn't I, need to use them, Doc. I ain't gotten there yet. I don't use it. I may talk like this in the class and things, but I don't use it. I ain't gotten there quite yet on that. I but mean, anyway, <laughs> but if, <laughs> if you want, if, if, if you do. So now, here's the deal. He had exegeted his context so well. And since y'all can't see it in the books, no need for me to do this, but I'm putting up another one. When I put it up the first time, it looked like you halfway can see it. But this is a book by J.D. Otis Roberts that Camilla went and did all that research on. And it's entitled Liberation and Reconciliation of Black Theology. Yeah. And remember I told you all that J.D. Otis Roberts argues, if we're going to reconcile, we have this ministry of reconciliation. In other words, if we're going to bring chasms of people together, we got to become earthy enough. That's why I kept saying earthy about the judge earlier to be able to handle these valley experiences. So you got to exegete not only the scripture, but you got to exegete the context, not just the text, but the environment, the ecology, the environment, the nature of the environment and the sociological constructs in that environment so that you are bringing a right now kingdom word to help people's behavior change in the valley or the context that you're in. And so Jay, um, Johnny Ray Youngblood understood that he had to do something. So here's how it worked out practically. He understood that he had a whole lot of brothers going up and down the streets of his church. But James, they would never come into church. In fact, he had more guys going up and down the sidewalks of the church than he had coming into church. And he discovered that they all would have bottles in their hand, large in part, most of the time throughout the day. They had beer bottles and all kind of stuff like that. So he said, I got it. The Super Bowl is a sporting event that interests a whole bunch of people, particularly men. Somebody said it, who he is earlier. Johnny Ray Youngblood said, 
We's going to have us a Super Bowl party in the church. That's what we's going to have. And we's, brother deacons, are going to let these men come in the church with their beer bottles. And all of this is recorded in this book upon this rock. And do you know that by the time that Super Bowl was over and the ministry that he dealt with and the God talk that he had going on, those gentlemen left that Super Bowl party and they exchanged their beer bottles for Bibles and became some of the most faithful people in helping him prosecute his ministry across the years. So uh, you'll find how to go about understanding your context in this study in congregations book. It deals with ecology, seeing the congregation in context, the culture and identity in the congregation, the process dynamics of congregational life. See, all of these things, the resources that you can find, the leadership, going definitely, and the various methods for congregational study, profile, inventory, standard demographic and religious involvement variables. All right? So y'all order that book today. Don't go right on there and get that book because you have to have that um, because this is, this is a piece that helps you um, tremendously um, in doing your work. So studying congregations, uh, make sure you get that and understand that in relationship to uh, what that's all about. Any questions on the book that you need to get? It's right on your syllabus. Okay. Get on the syllabus. Huh? No, I didn't. I, I, I may have overlooked it. I no, didn't. no. Go, go, go to. Um, I second. see it. I see it at the bottom of the page. I see it. I see it. You see it? All yes, right. sir, I see it. That study and congregation. That's going to be. That's going to be huge. Because you figure out stuff. I, um, at one point, I was the pastor of a historic traditional church, and that church decided to oust me. They um, they fired me from this historical church. And um, so I was fired. All this powerful stuff I'm doing now, I was fired from the church. When that happened, Gamelia, I thought life was over. You can't overcome being fired from a church. I didn't do anything wrong. No, didn't sleep with nobody, no drinking, no doing nothing wrong with my family. That done absolutely nothing wrong. I just was being too much of an adjutant around the things that uh, Bishop Dixon was talking about yesterday. And God had to carve out a learning space, a place for me to be where I could be the prophet that God has called me to be and unencumbered by all of those kind of restrictions. But I never forget in that church where they fired people like Harold Carter and Vernon Johns. Uh, break it to me easy. How many of you have heard of Vernon Johns, Vernon Vernon Napoleon Johns? See that great movie Beautiful. from him, uh, that James Earl uh, Jones paid, played of him. Anyway, uh, when Vernon Vernon Napoleon Johns was pastor of the church. The second time, they fired him the first time, figured out that he was so good that they invited him back a second time. 1920 to 26, he was the pastor. He got fired. They brought him back in 1941 and fired him again in 1943. And that's when he <laughs> left. <laughs> he left and made his way on to, watch this, to Montgomery, Alabama to the Dexter Church there in Montgomery and became the forerunner to Martin Luther King, who came to launch that Montgomery Mass Improvement Association movement with Rosa Parks that changed the world. Mm -hmm. But set the tone for King. They put Vernon Johns out of Dexter and they said, we's gonna find us a more, uh, a comma preacher, just as intelligent as Vernon Johns, but he won't be talking about his old okay Hayden lynch a nigga in Montgomery. We don't want to hear nothing about that. Yeah, we're going to tell somebody much more vilder. So they found Martin King and the 
first Sunday that he got up there to preach at the new pastor. He didn't talk about love like he did to court the church. He got up there and talked about we cannot have all of these injustices here in Montgomery. And then the deacon put the head down. And I talked to Nesbitt. I interviewed him at, for my work at Duke. Nesbitt said, we put our heads down and said, oh, God, here we go again. This same old stuff. You don't want to hear none of that. But I learned in Court Street that when Vernon Johns was the pastor of Court Street, a lady, lady by the name of Lula Diggs got happy in church at that great church, Silk Stocking Church. And Lula Diggs got so happy she got up and she made all this noise. And Vernon John said, sit down, shut up. You don't even, you doing all that hollering. You can't even hear what I'm saying. You don't even know what I just said. Sit down, shut up. Then she brought her baby. And the baby started crying. And Vernon John said, tell that baby to shut up. Too much, too much noise. People can't hear what I'm saying. And it created a culture in Court Street where the people were fearful to praise God because of how Vernon handled those situations. He was really wanting him to hear what he had to say, but he may not have been thinking that it would create a, a um, climate and culture where people were afraid to praise. And that's why prior to me getting there, they were cold and indifferent in how they worshiped. And I came in at going off to the full gospel in, New, in Louisiana with, with Paul Morton, all that crowd, Camilla. That's when I got to Court Street, came back throwing water on the people in the congregation. And they said, oh no, we can't have all of this here. <laughs> and, and my dear friend uh, in Roanoke, um, who, who's gathered unto the Father now, Antonio Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Legendary. what you say, Cherry? The legendary is church down the street from my job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. His wife. We were all at James Madison University together. So by talking to Virginia Hughes at Court Street when I was doing my work on Vernon Johns, Virginia Hughes is the one that told me that story about how Vernon Johns had handled Lula Diggs and her little baby son. Lewis Diggs, who when I became the pastor of the church, had then ascended to be the chairman of the board, of the trustee board of the church. And so once you start finding that stuff out before you do too much moving, you can begin to understand why people are the way they are, what you probably need to deal with to get them to accept something different, rather than just going and doing whatever you're doing without the contextual knowledge that you need for appropriate theological application, because you understand the theology that exists before you get there in that setting, church, city, county, town, hospital, prison, school, wherever it is. Is any of this making sense? And this studying congregation book really helps us have a level of appreciation for that. All right? All of you seem to be veterans in ministry, maybe. Um, I oh, hope you listen to what I'm saying. We do. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it's simple things like moving the grand piano in the church to put in a keyboard. Mm -hmm. You, you got to understand all those dynamics, right? Yes, sir. She, she dead now. She told me, you don't come in here moving people's furniture around in their house. So I had to first understand they understood that it's their house and it's their furniture. So you just don't move the furniture around, even though you use the pastor without understanding the theology of how they got stuff arranged and why they got it arranged. My Lord. I never forget also in my first church, little teeny church, no size or bigger than the size of my screen here in Mecklenburg County. 
When I went in that church, all the walls were wood paneled. That's dark. You can like that. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. And then on the back wall was a picture of Jesus and all these, Jesus white, all the people around the table, white, blue eyed. And uh, I said to myself, this is the impression that these people may have of Jesus. And all of these people, they're all white. So they might not even think they relate. So I'm going to take that down because theologically, I think that's a false representation. But Chair, I went and took the picture down. They didn't ask nobody. I took it down and moved it into one of the little classrooms in the back and hung it up there in the wall back there. So I said, well, yeah, I moved it, but I didn't throw it away. I put it back there in the back room. They said, do you know that the Brown family gave us this picture? And the Brown family invested all of this money in this congregation. And if they find out you moved that picture, you're going to have some serious problems. So you might have to move that picture back. <laughs> said, I'm, not, I'm not moving it back. That's so funny, because I just asked the deacon for out the grove, can I bring my own drummer on Sunday? <laughs> I literally just text one of the deacons out there, because I can't take it no more. <laughs> and, uh, he said, no, deacon so-and-so going to go ahead and play this Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you just got to have to figure out, now, by the way, you know, I did turn out all right. I upset the Brown family, some of their descendants. But after a while, I was able to teach on it, Bishop. I should have done the teaching. What I learned now, I should have done the teaching first and then let a celebration to the teaching be the removal of the picture and putting it in the appropriate place. But I was young and naive at that time. I just went and did it backwards. I moved it first, then did the teaching later. Well, and so this is what this class is about, trying to make sure that you have an appreciation for your context, the theology of that context, the theology that you have, and how you're going to bring transformation in that context around a problem area. Does any of this make sense? Yes, sir. Right. right. So <laughs> you're going to write a paper on your reading of the study and congregation book. And of course, that is going to be due December the 2nd of 2022. Just make sure you make adjustments. If you didn't know, get a chance to do that. And we'll be talking about this a couple of more times. And of course, you're gonna do your evaluation and you're gonna do your, um, your attendance, okay? So now having established that, what I think I want to do is to first make sure um, that I say a word about um, doing pretty good here on time. I want to say a little bit about context first, contextualism. All right. The first thing you need to establish in the DMAN program is your context. Where is going? Where is the place that you are, as Wyatt Walker would say, my advice for my DMAN program? This is where you're going to prosecute. I know that's strange language, but that's what he embraced. Prosecute. In other words, what he was trying to say that you own trial. And you got to get your P, your A, your S, your T, your O, your R, or whatever you are trying to be in that context. If it's parachurch, you're trying to earn your title. You got to earn the confidence of those who are going to be the followers that you are, in fact, the resident theologian that you have the words of life and you can help guide them as they seek to implement that word of life, those crumbs, if you will, that can prolong life. James Perkins has a sermon entitled The Gospel in Prolonging Life. It's same thing as the crumbs, keeping Lazarus alive. So, what is your context? That's the first thing I want to establish. You can't go anywhere in this DMN program without a context, a place where you prosecute, where you defend your faith as an apologetic, you know, as an apologist, you have to have reason arguments to defend the positions or beliefs that you have about certain things. Another one that got me in trouble at that same historic church, I had two opinions and it was around the issue of who should do funerals and weddings in the church. Now, the individual who was my 
pastor who baptized me, Dr. David Collins Forbes Sr., his brother, James Alexander Forbes. Some of you may know them. A great, uh, uh, their brother was a great, uh, and still is a great uh, uh, mm -hmm. psychologist. Mm -hmm. Great family. They buried well. Uh, come from Bishop James Alexander Forbes, the, the bishop, and, and buried well. And got congressmen in the family and all that. Well, one thought on funerals and weddings is, I am the resident theologian. I have the biblical mantle. So if anybody dies in this church, whether I knew them or not, I'm doing all the funerals. Ain't nobody else coming in here. Don't come in here with no suggestion or no other body else gonna do no funeral in this church. I'm doing it, right? Now the other philosophy is whoever the family wants, let them have whoever they want. Now, Dr. Forbes is not here to defend himself, but I just believed in him so beautifully about that. He said, if you do not establish up front that you are the pastor, they will run over you and you will be nothing but a pawn the entire time you're there. So you got to establish yourself early. And then at the same time, I was in class with Sam Proctor at Duke. And I was having this wrestling and Sam Proctor told me, he said, when I, when I went to the Abyssinia church, people told me that they wanted so-and-so to do the eulogy for them. I told him to go right ahead. I went and played golf during that time. It didn't bother me at all. Now, I didn't listen to Sam Proctor. I decided that I needed to establish myself. I made that church red hot with me about that issue. Now I've gotten to the point where I'm like Sam Proctor. Bishop Camellia, they want you to come do the eulogy? Go right ahead and do it. I'm going to go play golf, go with my wife, and go on vacation to the Bahamas and come back. You know, do whatever you want to do. Can, can I uh, interject something here? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Doc, you know, Dr. Coleman, and this is, this is my theological belief, and I don't know if this is, well, this is where I am. I, <laughs> I believe that when a, a church calls a pastor, He's the pastor of the church. And when people introduce him, they say, or her, they say, this is the pastor of my church. And then it's after you marry and bury and eat with people, you become their pastor. And then they introduce you as, this is my pastor. Wow. 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 M meaning, meaning that until they call you, you may be the church's pastor. And some pastors got to have a name on the door. If you got to have your name on the door, you're probably not the pastor. You have your name on the door, but if it wasn't there, you still the pastor because you have become my pastor, right? That's what you say? You're the yes, sir. personal and, pastor yeah. of the people within that congregation. Yes, sir. So on, on weddings and funerals, what is the policy at your church around who does those? Well, the, the, the policy is whoever the people want, but <laughs> normally because I have become their pastor, they want me. Gotcha. Cherry, what's your what's your what's your theological position on that? All right, Cherry might be busy. Q, what about you? Well, it depends. In my in my book, that's not a major issue. It's a minor one. And uh the bereaved, in my opinion, should if they choose to have another another pastor. That's fine. I don't major on minor, so that's where I was going with that. To me, that's something minor. Now, that's, Q, something this is, uh, that's huge what you just said. Um, Sam, uh, Dr. Walker, I mentioned these people often because they impacted my life. Dr. Proctor uh, uh, put it this way. Every issue is not a cross issue. Correct. You got to determine what issues you are prepared to die over and what issues are you willing to live through until transformation comes. Amen. And Amen. so what I did was I decided to make that a cross issue when then the truth of the matter is it really 
maybe is not a cross issue as such. But what I was wrestling with, and somebody on this Zoom may be wrestling with, or you come in contact with, is what if something as ginger and tender as death gets mishandled by a preacher, and your people are there, and they give bad theology, Mm -hmm. and embrace and support practices that you are trying to move the people away from this is true so now can you ever undo that or is that the death nail in your coffin or when it comes to things like weddings and they begin to produce another construct around god's understanding of a wedding no not to mention now we wrestle with same-sex marriages and I can get married to a car if I say I love the car and the car love me. No, nowadays, right. And the person comes in and they are able to do that in your congregation because you got a policy that says whoever the person wants no. can do the wedding. I mm-hmm. I, 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 I still... Uh, 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 wait a minute, Camille. What you talking about there? <laughs> no, no. I maintain... I mean, I, I, look, I'm, I'm the pastor of the church that I pastor. <laughs> and, and, and I maintain the right of approval and rejection. Okay, all right. Okay. You, you know, now I had a situation and my wife is downstairs <laughs> and someone <laughs> in my family very close to me was getting married mm-hmm. and his wife's sister who is gay was supposed to walk her down the aisle. And I said, that's not going to happen here today. Okay. That's, I, not, I, not happen. That's not going to happen here today. And 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 the young the person got very mad. Yeah. Uh, and she was really really mad. But my wife went back to talk to her and say, "Ain't no need of you being mad, because if my husband said it ain't going to happen today, like that, it ain't going to happen." And, and you the you the pastor. Yeah, yes. And it, I'm that, the that, pastor, that, and nobody was upset about it except the person who I literally wasn't a member of the church. What group says? I got you. Marissa, you got anything to say on this before I keep moving on quicker too? Anything you want to add? James no, Richard? I do. I do. Um, I really do believe when Moses was told to delegate, and I, I just really feel like you know, you select the people that God has has shown you are capable of fulfilling the duties that you can assign to them and I really do I do I do believe in delegation especially if you know someone has a pastor has been mentoring you know or working with a family this that and the other I mean I feel like it makes sense but those people under your covering that are sort of working on your behalf I really you know you as a pastor should really um have rules and limitations set for them in terms of you know, what are the beliefs of the church and all those things. Now, it's not time to delegate if our beliefs aren't in the same place. And we need to understand that if we stray from these beliefs and practices in the mission of the church, then, you know, that's insubordination. Um, So, but I'm a a woman that believes in delegation. And I did have a question for Bishop Gamillion. Was this in absence of a father that this particular person wants to walk this person down the aisle? I don't understand. <laughs> well, I, 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 I literally don't know what the issue was, but uh, it, was, it was sprung on me. This, this was not something that was, I was made aware of. It was something that they sprung on me at the moment, uh, 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 I think believing that I wasn't going to say anything uh, about it but but my the oh, person my son knew where my stand where my where my stance was wow so the good, I, good good stuff Marissa I, I love the way you all are thinking this through and all of these things have got to be thought through in a specific area that you are going to be dealing with in your D-Man program. Now, this is later in the first year, but you got to be thinking now about, for example, uh, you'll get 
I don't know if she gave it in your materials, but there's a piece here on hidden rules. What are the hidden rules? See, there are rules that nobody talk about because they're traps. Are you smart enough to figure out what are the hidden rules that you don't see on any sign, right? They didn't tell you at the interview. But yet, these are rules we go by. Yeah, in the first church I had. You know, and, and oh, once you mess it up, you may have found your death blow in the hidden rule. So how am I am I going to know what the hidden rules are in the church? That, that's church, why yeah. that, that that's why I come right to your church. That's why before you take a church, it may not apply to any of you or any job. Give me the records of the minutes over the last 10 years. Show me the budget flow. Give me some information that tells me about how you all derived at this. Your bylaws and covenants and all of these things and what they call standard operating procedures. I want to see all of it. Because if you don't have that information, you can't figure out the hidden rules because they still aren't in any of that. But it'll give you a clue. Cherry, you want to say? Yeah. So I guess being walking into this um, place in Forest, you know, I liked what Bishop Comey said. I'm, I'm the pastor of the church that I passed. <laughs> and I guess my biggest question, one of my wife's biggest withdrawals, she loves where, where we're going, but she's been like, you know, why don't you just start something, um, plant in Roanoke where we at? And wow. it's like, well, just hearing y'all's testimony and y'all's experiences with, um, you know, your, your, your different pastorates is just like going into an initial, I'm still young, I'm 30 years old. So, you You're know, young. I'm proud of you, sir. <laughs> and you, you 30, you've been doing That's this. That's why they want you, brother. That's why they want you. That's right. And you, and you haven't quit yet. You're doing good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm I'm in front of a work computer. Got my iPad studying for Bible study tonight. Got my phone in my head in class. Got a school board meeting next week, so I got a lot going on. <laughs> wow, in there. But uh, I guess my biggest question is, you know, it, this could be off the record, but I guess since we're on the topic, what do I come in without imploding, or do I come in um, with suggestions? I mean, Doctor Coleman, you know where I'm where I'm going, sure. and they're kind of, I'm not going to say ahead, but they do, they have been doing some things, but, you know, this is new. This is new territory for me. It's different from being an executive pastor to a senior pastor. Sure. Uh, have you had in a good talk with Marcus yet? Oh, yeah. He, he's okay. on standby. <laughs> All right. Well, you obviously way down the road, if you're having good conversations with him, I would listen to what he has to say about hidden rules, yeah. and again, hidden rules are salient, unspoken understandings mm -hmm. yeah. that cue the members in that context that the given individual does or does not fit. You know, uh, uh, you know the first church I had, which I was called to, the hidden rule was the chairman of the deacon board was supposed to be in charge. Wow. That that was the that was the hidden rule, but and and I broke it, <laughs> and it became a wrestling match for the seven years I was there. Uh, I was able to increase the budget fourfold and build a bigger plant than they had sitting there when I got there. But then the deacons wanted to take. Uh, credit for that and and all of that and yes, sir. So, uh but that was the hidden rule the pastor that was there before me was there 39 years and if he said something in the meeting that the chairman didn't like he would call him into a, to the study and he would come back out and they ch and change all of that stuff you got to believe it though that, that was the hidden rule that's right that's right 
So, so that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And um, uh, while meetings are going on, you can have an old man, old deacon that's in that position, young for that matter, they got a cane, if you will. And um, if they move the cane to the left, they ain't got to say a word. That means vote yes. <laughs> if they put it to the right, it means no. They ain't got to say a word. If they put the cane in the middle between their legs, that means I don't care what you do. That's a hidden rule. Yeah. You know, See? Dr. Coleman, I um, I heard, uh, you know, it's interesting you use the term, and I've, I've been sitting here laughing and, and wrestling with that that notion about contextualization. We've, I've uh, come to call it a uh, uh, culture, church yeah. culture. Yes, Each sir. church has that's the culture. Own culture. That, that's it. And as a new pastor going into any church, it's, I don't think that it's a good idea to touch anything. You, it's good for him to go and sit and that's right. and, for that God and preach the word of God and try to bring everybody up. And I'm going to say it like this, and I don't mean bring everybody up. Let me let me be more clear. Try to find some found, some forms of standards and let, that everybody can agree on learn the culture then you can start actually maneuvering around yep uh i was warned about that several times uh from a a, a pastor his name was uh, dr williams he kept he would often encourage me i still uh talk to him and he still says that he's had a billion churches from here from houston to louisiana and uh before he settled where he is now here in houston and he's he's often said that he's talked about his downfalls, pitfalls, and mistakes. And one of the major ones was he said, as a young man, he would go in and try to make changes. And he said, that's why he said that's why I never kept those churches for too long. Now that's just that's what he that was his advice to me every time. So listening to him and some of his pitfalls, I, I guess I would say I learned uh, uh, a lot from him. Uh, He's a, uh, uh, but anyway, I said all that to say, kind of, he kind of made me take a look back at the, he says, go in, he says, learn the culture first. He said, before you go touching anything, he said, cause you could wind up messing something up that uh, uh, his example was a, a, a tree. He talks about all the time, he had a tree saw it down, supposedly the founder of the church that planted that tree and he got himself into a lot of trouble. He would talk about that all the time, but uh, that's just funny. That that tree was uh, 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 apparently, uh, uh, you know, I guess a symbolic of the first pastor there who actually planted the church. So this is very yeah, so very, very good. Cube. So culture is the way we do things here. It, yeah. it is. It speaks to the way we do things, and you want to be able to figure out how things get done. All right. So that's very important. Now let let me let me say this. You start with your church. So the context, I need to find this out real quick. What do you, what's going to be your context? The place where you think you want to find a problem, right? And figure out how you're going to help that problem be better. That, that problem is going to be your ministry focus. It's going to be the ministry that you're going to focus on and you're going to try to treat that problem. So for me, got 159 men on the road. 20 of them are active in the church. The other 130 some, I may see them Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter, if that. It, it, so, it, so what do I, so what am I going to do to increase participation? All right, so do you see that? But I was doing it at Court Street Baptist Church. That's my context. So where, where is the context that you believe that you're going to do your work here in the D-Man Project? Uh, Bishop Camelia, where is that going to be? What's your context? I, yeah, my context is going to be greater than that. I, okay. Because my context is the church at large. I'm listening to you. You know, you, my, my, my context is, is the church at large and the relationship and between the large and the small church. And um, I, I stop there, Camelia, because I don't have a lot of time. Yes, Let me help you. I'm sorry. So, your context has got to be definable. Yes. So, is this going to be participating churches in the full gospel? 
fellowship? Yes or no? It, it, it could be, but it's even bigger than that. Well, you're going to have to get that size down. Because in a D-Men project, you cannot say the universal church because you can't be an expert on the universal church as such. You don't have enough time to do that in a D-Men project. So what you're going to have to do, if it's not going to be the church you pastor, it can be a denomination. It can be a fellowship. Okay. In which you're going to have a specific pool of individuals. Otherwise, you can't measure your effectiveness on whatever it is you're doing because you're talking about the universal church. And Lord have mercy. Somebody told me the other day they think at a small count, there's 600,000 churches in America. Hmm. So you no way you can do a, you, you can do that. You can't do no contextual analysis on 600,000 churches. But you can hone in on however you want to configure it. It is going to be a, a um, mixed intervention with the full gospel fellowship participating churches and A, B, C, D, E, and E, and F. But it can't be the whole, whole thing. You don't need that. It's too large anyway because you're going to hone in on something, whatever it is. So you got to decide what the scope is. Okay? All right. Some of my biggest fights with little Wild Walker and Franklin Richardson on getting myself straight on what I could accomplish in my D-Man work. I wanted to erect the Vernon John, Vernon Napoleon Johns Academy uh, for the development of African American males. And he told me that's wonderful, but you can't accomplish that in a six week period to treat a project for a D-Man program. So you got to scope it down. What I could do is increase the male participation and awareness and all of that of that vital need to be a part of the church and to get more involved. So I'm not taking you away from what you want to do. I'm saying for your demand piece, it may be universal, but so that you can have credibility, I've looked specifically at these churches, full gospel churches and whomever else you're talking about and lock in on that because you got to study that. This is, this is, we're not talking about Gamilia because he's brilliant. I'm not talking that he would even think this. This is not some... Uh, swinging through the tulips exercise. We're going to expect you to do a contextual analysis around, that's your next paper. That's what we're talking about. And Marissa, going back, you'll look at the next paper as the contextual analysis. And you got to break down that context. We want to know everything about that context on two fronts, inside the church or churches and the communities in which those churches are dealing with. Now, I know if you're dealing with something large at the fellowship, I know you can't tell me about every city, but you can do a little bit better job at getting at it if you identify what you're talking about rather than talking about the entire United States. Does that make sense, Camelia? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. so good. So you, we'll come back to you later on that, but you got to narrow that down because you're going to have to do an analysis on that, pulling together everything. Uh, and I'm bringing us to close. Mr. Richard, what's your context? I can't hear you. You're on mute. I can hear you now. Not sure exactly what is the context right now, but I'm thinking more as far as, for as bylaws within the church, especially for the Baptist church. Yeah. So, it, it, James, that's a good answer. Good. It could be the church you're a member of. Are you, are you not the pastor, right? Uh, no, sir. I'm not I'm not pastor. I'm the, what's your role in it? What's the church you attend? James, what church do you attend? Oh, the 577. Oh. Well, Richard, did you tell me what church you attend? Hmm. Okay. I think he's right. working. Oh, he's at work. Okay, I understand. That's fine. I'll come back to James. Marissa. Okay. Yes. Which you wish gonna be your context? Ooh, well now I'm scared because I mean I am, as I explained earlier, my fivefold ministry. I am a teacher. 
okay. not a pastor, right? That's so, fine. so my audience are mm-hmm. mothers. Okay. okay. Gotcha. So, of um, children between the ages, <clears throat> uh, basically elementary school age children. Okay. Now to narrow, because I was planning on doing this primarily online. Okay. So, to you know, my the net that I was going to cast was the United States, but I was going to focus in on fifty women. Does that make sense? Yep. Or fifty families. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's it. <laughs> And if you're where, are these, country, where, where are these 50 families? Where are they located? They can be anywhere in the United States because it's going to be an on, it's an online ministry. So my interaction, you know, is going to be primarily interacting with them online. Mm-hmm. And what type of families are these? So these are families of, well, I've narrowed it down to families only by the age of the children. It's very hard because I don't believe that my primary audience will be African American because that's not what it's been thus far. I and it doesn't have to be. And it doesn't okay. have to be. It doesn't. Okay. And what we're going to do because of the interest of time, this is good. And who your core faculty advisors are, here's an assignment for you all to make sure you do. You need to spend some time with your advisor so you can get clear on your context. Because you got to have a manageable context by which you have some authority to compel them to come together over a protracted period of time to do some research with them that you have developed. And we've got to be able to be sure that it actually exists and that it's functional, it has some level of sustainability to it. This will never happen with you all, but we have one group. I'm preparing to close you. That uh, one person that made up a context, the church that didn't even exist. Oh, wow. You see. And once we found out about it, that person had to be removed from the program because we, you can't do that. So either you got an established context, or if you're trying to establish something, you got to work with your advisor to make sure that it fits what it is that we know will work for you. So that you can adequately defend yourself when it's time to go before your doctoral committee. And it's going to be hard to defend something that people aren't clear on the context and how you're managing it. It's suitability for a DMAN program uh, such as ours. But Marissa, I think uh, that your person can help you. Is that Dr. Jackson? Then you may not have to get back on, but Dr. Jackson, Dr. <laughs> Coleman from Chameleon. So I'm going to work with the good doctor. Whoever your advisor is, that's one of your first order of business is this week. Uh, very shortly is to get with your advisor to help identify clearly your context. Now, if you're like Jerry and you get called to a new church in midstream, I hope that whatever that transaction trend is going to happen either quickly or whatever, because then you kind of got to start over again because you're probably not going to be able to um, do a work in a context that you leave. Do you see? But we, we find ways to make things happen. You won't, when I say start, not at the beginning of the program, but you may have to go back and do some revisions because context may, may differ, okay? And one thing about Alpha Grove, they're familiar with having a pastor working on a doctrine because he did his uh, around social media. So at least they understand that part. All right, so class, let me try to bring this to a closure here. What you're going to have to do is learn your context. That's what contextualization is all about. The strengths of your context, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats. Meaning that as far as the identifiable challenges in your church or whatever group you're dealing with. So if you're assembling 50 families, what are the identifiable challenges amongst these families? And you got to understand all of that. Then you go to the mission field. So if my church is in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I'm the pastor of Providence Transformation Church International, then I got to do all of the background on my church. Then I got to understand all of the goings on in Lynchburg, Virginia. So I got to go to my chamber of commerce and understand what's going on in the business community. I got to go to city hall and understand the vision statement for the city 
Uh, now that we are there, y'all 2020 for 2020, 2040, 2050. What's going on in terms of employment? What's going on in the educational system? What, what are the challenges around media in our city, entertainment? All of the various aspects of community, you got to do research on to find out population, unemployment rates, stressors, you know, what, what, what are the challenges that are going on in your community? And then you match that then with a theology. And I will close by suggesting to you that uh, theology, of course, is the study of God. And uh, when we go deeper, uh, I really like the womanist theologians who have said that theology is God talk. It is God talk. You got to bring before your contemporary context, God talk, God is speaking. Here is what God has to say about whatever the problem is that you are addressing. Um, w. Franklin Richardson told us in class that theology is the attempt of the human to represent the thinking of God. That theology is the attempt. That's all y'all doing is making an attempt. And Charlie Adams said, it takes a long time before you get a definitive statement about what God has to say, but you're in process. So Franklin Richardson said, theology is the attempt of the human to represent the thinking of God. I'll close on the fact that Paul Tillich adds that theology is a function that must serve the needs of the church. So again, getting back to the judge, as she was engaged in simple talk, keep it simple, stupid. I need to cuss, cuss. If I need to be as the Romans, be as the Romans, whatever it is to win you to Christ. So your theology becomes a function to serve the needs of the church. So that you are to provide a statement of truth of the Christian message. We're not interested in eisegesis. We're not interested in you coming up with something that you've added to the Judaizers, if you will. You must discover biblically the truth so that you provide a statement of truth of the Christian message so that when God is speaking, God speaks the truth. You have to come up with that statement and then provide an interpretation of this truth for every new generation. That's what Paul Tillich in Systematic Theology argued, that theology must become functional to meet the needs of the church, therefore providing a statement of truth of the Christian message and an interpretation of that truth for every new generation. I gotta shut my class down now. Uh, all these theology books I got on here, I didn't get anywhere near Owen Thomas's Introduction to Theology how this works itself practically and the, the problem of the fact that they like Jesus but not the church insights from emerging generations where many of people want to get to Jesus but they can't get to Jesus because your church is in the way they like Jesus but not the church and it's been a problem for a long time uh we'll shut out here now you've done five classes it's introductory I will give you some dates on when we will gather but again next and then again before December the second. I think Dr. Barrett gave you already his dates for nuts and bolts. So you got now between now and December to get these papers done. So don't wait until the day before. Five classes, self-discovery and ministry. We're going to meet a couple of times before December. Spiritual formation. We'll meet a couple of times before December. And during those times, We'll talk about things relative to that. You have nuts and bolts in academic writing. You're going to meet a couple of times and talk about that. You have laying the foundation, a couple of days to talk about that. And then contextualization and theological application. I'm going to try to do all of that in a compressed kind of way where we might get together and I'll spend 20 minutes talking about one thing, move to the next couple of times to keep us going 
And then you know by Friday, you're going to do an entry reflection on each of these five attempts in one setting. Of course, you don't know about the other two, but we want you to go ahead and do that now. You're going to do that by Friday. You've attended the class. I know you're going to show up for the other sessions when they have been scheduled around when you all tell me through Marissa what you agreed to do. And then um, um, you'll get the paper done by December the 2nd. That's it. We have we have five what? papers due. Huh? We have five papers due. We have five papers due by December the 2nd. You can turn them in anytime before that or by that date. So my question is, because uh, I came late, you were talking about the spiritual autobiography. Is that a, is that one of the five or is that an extra paper? No. Take a deep breath. Excellent question. When you look at um, the whole notion of your D-Man manual, Q, tell us what page that was. It's on 72, I think it was. Uh, it's on 73. 73. Give me a y'all go there. I, I got five minutes to make sure y'all clear on this and then, then I'm out your hair. Uh, go to your manual. Go to page 73. What I want you to make sure that you understand, I know Marissa may have, to, have left us, but it will all make sense of this. Um, Now, you have several components. And by the way, one of you wanted to know about elders in the church. Was that you, James Ritchie? Who was it that wanted to know? I, listen, I'll get with you because I had a good explanation about all that. Yes, run clean out of time, but I will get to you. That was an excellent question, and I'll talk to you about that uh, and whatever other questions you all may have had. But um, what I'm trying to tell you is you will see that there's several components to getting those 63 hours. The colloquium gives you some hours towards 63. Then completing each of these classes that take place during the colloquium gives you some credit. So you're going to get 12 credits for classes outside of the 15 days for colloquium. So you're going to do three colloquiums, five days of each. That's going to be 15 credits towards the 63. Then you're going to get 12 more credits just from these required classes. That's going to give you 12. So that's going to give you 27 credits towards the 63 that you need to get the DMIN program. Within those required classes to get that credit, you got to do a paper for each of those classes. So you're going to get credit for those five classes by completing a paper along with the other two things by December the 2nd. Then you get the credit for that. Those are papers relative to those classes to get the classes covered. Then you're going to get credit for phase papers that you're going to do that are out. The classes are just to help get you ready to do the actual phase papers that you have to do, which you get credit for those. The first one that is due by October the 31st is your spiritual autobiography. And you see the outline for it on page 73, minimum of 10 pages. Then if you go to page 74, the class we just had on contextualism and theological application, that's the class you need and the stuff you're reading and it will help you to do a good job at describing your context, understanding the history of it, the challenges that are had in that. Then you're going to go into the mission field and you're going to look at a history of the city, the status, the population, medium income, educational dynamics, law enforcement issues, all of the challenges of the context. And that paper is a minimum of 10 pages. And it has a due date on your sheet that we gave you at the beginning. Then when you finish that, you're going to go to your signature paper, minimum of 10 pages, where you're going to take the interest of and passions of your spiritual autobiography and meet them against one of the identifiable challenges in your context. And that's going to be where you're going to synergize to determine what problem you're going to address for the rest of your time in the d program. And then you're going to that synergy paper will say in section C, here's what I believe God is calling me to address as a problem to do my demand work. Then after you do that, you're going to do your foundation paper. And that's going to be a minimum of 20 pages. That's going to 
draw out of your laying the foundation class where you're going to learn how to find out what does the Bible have to say about my problem? Theolo what's my theology that I have to address my problem? So again, getting back to something as simple as weddings and funerals, you know, a lot of churches have huge problems over that. Well, you're going to determine if that's what you were doing your your problem, your situation on, or something in music, whatever it is, you would get a, a, a foundation for it in all of those areas. Then you're going to write your project proposal package. And after you've done that and get a license from your committee and treat it, then after you finish your project implementing it, you're going to do a timeline review of results of the model. And then bam, your final phase paper is going to be that daggone dissertation where you got to have a minimum of 100 pages in the body of the document with front matter and back matter that will be several many other pages probably, but don't count towards the 100 pages. Then you can tell the rest of us to go to hell if you want, get your degree and go on and do things for God in a glorious way. How about that? So those are the different papers. All right, we'll see you bright and early in the morning. God bless each of you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.